Today we're going to look at anchor rod and base plate design and although this isn't a sexy topic, it is one of those topics that covers a variety of mechanical engineering principles as a structural analyst. And so I find this example, if you can work through it and understand the key aspects of it, you're going to be well on your way of being a rock star in structural engineering. As you can see, this is a base plate. So a lot of buildings may have this. Um, you'll find this in a lot of places once you start paying attention to what it looks like. But what you have is you have um, several design considerations to take into account when you're actually sizing the base plate and also choosing your anchor rods. In particular, one design consideration is the bearing strength of the concrete. So what does this mean? This means that your base plate has to be large enough so that when this column is under load it doesn't fracture the concrete underneath it. If it does, well, not many people are going to walk into your building and uh, you know it's, it's not going to be acceptable. Uh, nobody wants to go into a building that shows signs of uh, you know wear and tear but also another design consideration is the base plate you know how thick do you need to make it uh, because if you don't make this base plate thick enough we're talking about this piece right here this square piece that's the base plate then your base plate can can break or yield or, or you know just deform fracture you know all, all the negative things can happen to it in addition these fasteners they need to be large enough so that um, any tensile load that's put on them they can handle the uh, stress and not fail and so you can do one of two things you can use high grade fasteners or you can add more fasteners along this this edge uh, to um, share the load and not fail but you can see here I've pointed out under each design criteria we've looked at three of these we're going to cover several fundamental mechanical engineering things that, that you should know for example um, combined bending and compression stresses uh, superposition margins of safety also um, as a mechanical engineer you're you have to be able to simplify a problem down you can make things as complicated as you want to but I'll tell you if you keep it simple where people can understand it and uh, you know you can make sense of it man you're, you're just gonna be a rock star where you're at so we're gonna look at the cantilever beam model simplification we're gonna treat this as a cantilever beam when we design this base plate when we design for the thickness also we're gonna cover load distributions uniform and triangular loads you need to know how to convert those to equivalent force systems um, and then we're gonna cover shear and bending moment diagrams in a later video but this is what we would do if we were designing this we'd want to draw a shear and bending moment diagram just to make sure our numbers are correct and also fastener tensile strength you know you can make this as complicated as you want to also but you can actually simplify it down tremendously by assuming your worst case in this case we're going to look at the temp the tipping condition model simplification and then we're going to go through and select the number of fasteners so that's a lot of stuff to get through so let's go ahead and jump into the first design criteria which is going to be designing for the uh, concrete uh, how how big do I need to make the base plate so that I don't crack my concrete so you can see here here's our a free body diagram or a cut through a column you got your concrete on the bottom you have your base plate and then you have your column that's loaded in compression and you also have it transferring a bending moment so if we look at this and and look at what loads are on the concrete we have a compressive uniform load caused by this load P so that produces a uniform compressive stress in this case we're assuming it's a uniform load distribution and then you also have a bending moment here that's creating a bending stress and that distribution is going to look a little bit different than your uniform load it's actually going to be in tension on this side and it's going to go uh, cross zero and be in compression on this side so this is where superposition comes in your worst case stress is going to be on the end here. If we add these two loads together, these two load distributions, we'll find that our, our new 
distribution, low distribution will be something like this with our worst case being on the end right here. And this is what we have to determine in order to see if our concrete will fail. If we determine this, we'll compare it to an allowable and then go from there, size the base plate from there. So if we look at the concrete itself, um, we're going to look at the bending moment and what type of stresses are caused by that bending moment. Um, your base plate is going to be N by B, so your base plate is, is uh, you know, that's the amount of uh, contact it has with the concrete. So we can simply do this real easily. Calculate our bending moment of inertia and then calculate our bending stress. We can substitute I into here and also put in our load right here to get our total on the end and then we calculate a margin of safety and uh, using a safety factor preferably you know I'm going to use like three in this case uh, we need to make sure that margin of safety is greater than one and that's it that's how you design for the bearings uh, for the concrete is uh, <clears throat> just three steps bending moment of inertia the total stress on the end right here and then a margin of safety that is really simple guys after you go through that procedure you can go design the base plate now so how thick does this base plate need to be well the first thing you want to do is do a model simplification in this case I'm gonna look treat this this um, overhang as a cantilever beam so if you treat it like that you're going to have just a cantilever beam that's that's of certain length and then also a load distribution that looks like this so how do I get this load distribution pretty straightforward I just calculate I split this load right here and this is what my load distribution would look like so I want to calculate my load at this point due to the compressive and bending stresses and then the load at the end and I get my connect those with the line and bang you have your load distribution so this is the force that's acting on the beam it's equal and opposite of the force that was acting on the concrete another simplification is is if you treat this beam this cantilever beam as a one inch wide strip you can actually easily uh, show that you can convert your stresses to line loads if you convert them to line loads you have some beam tables that you can take advantage of to calculate equivalent forces and, and uh, simplify your analysis tremendously and if you go through the math you can show that this can become a line load your bending stress can become a line load and you just sum those to get the total line load so that's simple enough um, so the next thing is you want to actually go through and calculate your worst case stresses. So if we're looking at this cantilever beam model, it's made up of a uniform load and a triangular load. So you can apply superposition and um, <clears throat> calculate your worst case stresses. So on a cantilever beam, your worst case is going to be uh, at the base right here. So that's what you want to do. You want to calculate your your action at A and your... your uh, bending moment at A or the end plate. So applying superposition we can break this down into a uniform load where a line load is equal to the compressive force over the area. In this case our area is going to be a one inch by the length of the beam. And then we have another uh, load distribution created by the bending stress and you can calculate your line load at this point and then your line load at this point as I suggested earlier so now you want to break this down into an equivalent force system so how do you do that well when you're dealing with line loads like this it's simply just the area under the curve so we got three areas here we want to look at. We want to look at A1, which is the area of this uniform load. And then we have A2, which is this triangular load. And then you have another uniform load right here we're calling A3. So just calculate the area in the curve. It's real simple. So for A1, it's going to be equal to the length of the cantilever times your uh, line load, compressive line load, and that 
equivalent force is going to occur at the middle of the beam because it's evenly distributed. That's obvious. So for A2, it's just going to be simply one half base times height, where your base is the length of the cantilever arm, and then your height is going to be the difference between uh, the line load at the end minus the line load at the beginning. And it's going to, the equivalent force system is going to occur at two thirds from the base of the cantilever beam. And you can, there's tables that show that. And then A3 is just going to be, uh, you know, your area under the, the uniform load. Um, and it's going to, just like we did with A1. And then that's going to occur at the midpoint of the beam also. So now you've drawn up, you know, your new free body diagram where you have converted your line loads into equivalent force loads. Now you can apply simple the simple equilibrium equations and determine your reaction at A and reaction uh, your moment reaction at A. So it's simple enough some of the forces in the y direction you can directly determine your reaction at A and then some of the moments at A you can directly determine your your moment at M sub A and that's straightforward um, I hope this is making sense it should the next thing you want to do is you want to look at the stress state of the elements on a beam you have um, if you recall if you've done this before you have a uh, shear just occurring at the middle of the beam and just tension and compression occurring at the top and bottom of the beam. They both mirror each other. So one's in compression, the other's in tension. So in this case, we're going to look at the bottom stress element and determine if we're going to fail uh, based on the stress on this element. So stress element one is going to be in tension as shown here. This load's pushing up, so we're going to have tension on the bottom, compression on top. So we're dealing with a bending moment here. So we need to calculate our bending moment of inertia, which is uh, going to be uh, this equation right here. And then you want to calculate your bending moment stress. And then after that, calculate a margin of safety. So the stress you get right here, you're going to compare it to your yield stress. So in von Mises stress when you have an element that's only loaded in tension and compression that's the only stress is acting on it you just compare the load to the yield stress and then uh, so you calculate a margin of safety make sure that's greater than one if it's not increase the thickness of your your base plate because if you increase the thickness right here your bending moment is going to go up and that means your stress is going to go down. So we looked at stress element one, stress element two. So stress element two is at the middle of the beam. That's simply just going to have a shear force on it. Um, so this is a little bit different, but here's your shear force, how you calculate your shear force of a rectangular uh, cross-sectional beam and you're going to use your reaction force at A because that's your worst case shear stress and you're going to divide that by the area and then you're going to compare it to an allowable so when we're looking at von Mises stress when you have a stress element that's only got shear loads on it well there's a correlation that shows that your shear allowable is going to be 0.77 times the yield strength of or the yield stress of the material so that's what you want to compare it to. Then you want to calculate a margin of safety. Make sure that's greater than one. If it's not, increase the thickness. So um, that's how you design the base plate, guys. Uh, that's really, really the beam model simplification. Uh, it c couldn't be any easier, guys. The next thing you want to look at, the third design criteria is fastener tensile strength. So how many fasteners and what size fastener do I need to put in to make sure that you know if this thing were to tip uh, the fastener would be able to hold that that uh, column down. And so if we look at this we're gonna analyze it at the tipping condition. So the tipping condition if you think about it 
is when you just have the load at the end here. So we showed load distributions on the previous uh, design considerations, but the worst case in, in this is if your load point load gets to the end, then it's like, oh no, you know, you got to hold it down because this thing's going to start to turn over. So that's how we're designing this fastener. And a lot of times in engineering, you know, we talk about optimization, optimization, you want to choose the smallest size fasteners and all this stuff. In many cases, though, you want to prevent <laughs> failure. So you, you want to kind of, I mean, if you want to be an engineer that's got, uh, you know, good sense. You want to over-design your your things in some cases. In this case, this is fast and easy, a way to, to determine uh, your fastener tensile strength. So this is how I'm going to design it because I don't want this column to ever fail. So if we look at this free body diagram, we can just apply the equilibrium equations and directly determine the tensile load on the fastener. And so we take the sum of moments about A, this location. You can determine uh, the force, the tension force on the fastener directly. And then after you determine the force on the on this left side, then you want to determine, you want to go select your fastener. So a lot of times uh, you may want to, uh, to spread this load out, this force load, uh, you may want to add more fasteners in the row. So if you increase it, um, as you increase the number of fasteners, that load shared among the fasteners is going to get smaller and smaller. So your force on the anchor bolt is actually going to be the total load, force load divided by N, the number of fasteners. And then from there, you can go um, compare that, that, uh, that load and choose a size and then um, based on the allowable and then you can calculate your margin of safety so guys that was three steps <laughs> they're pretty easy we're actually going to go through an excel and show you how this is done uh, but i wanted you to get some background on what i'm doing so that you fully understand what assumptions are being made and how to do this but this is a straightforward way of doing it um, you know uh, i i think if you think in these terms um, you can extend this analogy to other applications and that's important because you're not always going to have uh, you know a design book for every situation you're going to have to use the fundamentals and extend them to other problems because not every problem is the same right so I you know I think you know, if you want to be a good engineer, you got to understand the fundamentals. And that's what I'm striving to. That's what my message is today. So let's go into Excel and show you how this is can be done in a spreadsheet, how it can be organized, and how you can better develop your design problems uh, as you uh, face them throughout your career.